the greatest performance of the temporary. And so what will the world look like when the advanced communicators arrive? The arrival of the advanced communicators is the dedication of this episode. Welcome, dear listeners. Even though I had the intention of uh, taking some time to recover, but this topic came to me and it tapped me on the shoulder as if it's important to share now. And so in this episode, I would like to talk about communication, its role in the human life, and how do we advance it. And so in order to speak about anything, any system, we got to understand the edges or the boundaries of the system. That means whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, we are in uh, an existential system where there is resistance. And so this resistance calls forth for a response in the sense that I was even thinking of naming the title. Uh, excuse me, naming the subtitle of this episode, The White Blood Cells of Universalism. So that's, that could be the secondary subtitle. So the context that we find ourselves and why is it important to communicate? You know, why am I even as a person dedicating my life to talk? You know, aside from the opportunity of having an existential design that can communicate, it's like, where is the significance? <clears throat> I would like to begin by talking about the context where we find our life in. You know, for the longest time, especially, um, I would say, in our modern society now, the context of the world is singular, ladies and gentlemen. What does that mean? That means right now, the status quo, the majority of the population is acknowledging that we are in a one physical dimension. You know, and even though in scientific circles we say there are three dimensions of time, uh, excuse me, three dimensions of space, uh, length, width, height, and then we have <coughs> uh, beyond that X, Y, Z, uh, we have time. And so time is the fourth dimension in the sense that a person can be in one point in the space time, uh, actually in the space continuum. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is like, imagine you going to the same place twice. Um, when you look at it from the dimensions of space, it is the same place, it isn't, there is no change, but through the dimension of time, it's a new moment. <clears throat> so anyways, in life, uh, I am suggesting that any person, wherever you are, most likely your response to the context of your ecosystem, of your environment, uh, puts you as a concept, and this concept for now is functioning as if uh, one person in one world. But what I have noticed is that where our personality arises from is actually behind our eyes. And human beings have access to imagination. And the funniest thing is going on. The funniest thing is going on where we all have imagination. We all use imagination to, in some sense, imagine reality. But we treat imagination as if it's not real. <clears throat> and I would say for the first time, something unique is happening where human beings cannot make imagination equivalent to nothing because there is it subtler design <clears throat> what that means is I can imagine you know in front of my eyes I can go touch the ocean but if I imagine the ocean behind my eyes I can't go get the sensation of touching the ocean but the inner realm image exists so the context I am suggesting for, uh, is in some sense multidimensional and we have accepted too soon something we have seen a little of as if uh, physical reality is the tip of an iceberg and the majority of reality is an unobservable universe you know right now our perception is a very slight frequency uh, range in the electromagnetic spectrum
sorry guys, this was on mute for a second. More than a second, but <clears throat> pretty much uh, I was saying that um, when we look at the advancement of communication and if we were to, t to consider the idea of evolution, Evolution is another way of saying the world became people and people began noticing the world. In my vision, it was just stuff. What that means is there was just the world. There was no <coughs> uh, mind to fathom it. From an unconscious world, there emerged an unconscious body. For the first time, there was a physical creaturehood separate from the earth that could move on the earth, that could have some sort of basic consciousness that, yo, I'm somewhere and I'm moving. <clears throat> but the me is very, is, is, was a more complex advancement. That means for a long time in our evolution, it is fair to say that <clears throat> the creature was moving by the ecosystem. The ecosystem, the environment was our mind. That means communication wasn't advanced back in the day in the sense that communication was the world moving and the creature had no choice. There was no additional dimension of a diversion from nature. Nature was not the law. Nature was the movement of the universe. That means our eyes uh, were the planet before they were these eyes. Now, what happened after the unconscious self emerged, a sort of body emerged? This unconscious self became conscious of itself, whether the creature saw its shadow, where the creature saw other human beings, whether the creature began to see uh, its reflection in a pond or in a giant piece of ice or whatever, right? There came self-awareness. And what that means is this self-awareness went beyond just the physical dimension. For the first time, the creature noticed it is in a location. And the evolution of the mind to the fathoming of, of location, it's as if for the first time the brain copy-pasted the outer realms and the inner realms and there began the subjective evolution. A sort of movement in behind our eyes before in front of it. And so we have come to the point of the conscious self. Right now as I am speaking, we are all individual physical phenomena, but as Immanuel Kant called it, in front of your eyes you find phenomena, behind your eyes you find noumena. And some people have even called this qualia, which we, uh, for some philosophers, which is the suggestion that there is an internal viewer of a thought prior to the thought being emergent in the outer realms. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say is that our species went through a phase of mastering physical movement. We were, we climbed things, we uh, even attempted to fly, you know, the Wright brothers saw birds and were like, you know, I, I want to be that. <laughs> cultivated mastery, this is another way of saying it, <clears throat> of physical movement. That means been there, done that, right now on the planet, I could tell you uh, there are people doing parkour, you know, there's skydivers, there's very uh, complex athletes, you know, athletes at a level of athleticism that many people cannot reach. <clears throat> you know, I have a great respect for all those human beings in the outer realms that whether they think they're using their mind or not, the fact that you are living as a physical being is a very honorable act. It is a universally honorable act. And when you realize it, then comes the significance of the mind. That means animals in the evolutionary <clears throat> uh, timeline, uh, in some sense, were fighting. You know, the psychology of the human being before we entered hunter-gatherer tribes was pretty much who is the biggest beast in nature, right? And you can totally see, like I, I know this, that human beings, it's as if we are a grand movement. You know, and our species was like, all right, we are here now, we are vast in numbers, and we advance forth into the unknown. You know, and in our advancement into the unknown, there has been many human beings who've had physical experiences, which you can say, if the mind of the species is connected, uh, or in some sense will be connected, our eyes will become a great database of human perception. 
that means no, whoever you are, whether your life has been mainly lived as a physical phenomena, as a body moving a mind, or as a non-physical phenomena, a mind moving a body, do not fear the future will restore all your blind spots. And if you're very wise, like the yogis and the ancient mystics, you will realize actually that at the edge of the past is the future. Something many people do not consider. Because we're in time, we think time started from nothing and then went on to something. But I will tell you, if there is a potential that the universe is an infinite activity, what that means is it's just like the result of a force and the force has to be there in order for there to be space. So in some sense, time is like a finite interpretation of something that is infinite in accordance to the individual's biology. So the starting point is individualism for the human psychology, of course. I perceived it in the sense that in the outer realms, I call it that in front of my eyes, I treat it as the outer realms, the realm where it's all about the management and the piloting of an object. Behind your eyes, I call that the inner realms, and in the inner realms, you are not a form, you are actually a formless viewer. As the Vedas, this ancient Vedic text says, the seer of the seen is unseen. So, it is now, you can say, a time where we need to advance our mobility behind our eyes. And this is becoming difficult if the, spe if the creature identifies with the outer realm first, then the inner realms. If you identify with the outer realms first, then the inner realms, your free will is not free. Your free will is bound. And of course, the concept of free will is a very huge uh, concept in philosophy. <clears throat> what I would say is, is that it, it's dependent on the freedom or how, if the consciousness of the human being is a candle, it's about the range, the candela uh, of illumination of the space, you know. For a long time, I felt that the purpose of physical reality is physical. It took me a while to realize that the idea of myself behind my eyes that changes in every environment I go, it, 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 in some sense there's new stimulus and the information <coughs> makes the psychology respond to it. The eyes are not an object. The eyes are kind of like how we have uh, when I say the eyes are not an object, I'm talking about sight. The access to sight is not purely objective. That means light enters our eyes, it hits the nerves at the end of our eyeballs, you know, <coughs> and <coughs> there are uh, pigment receivers. So the nerves behind the eye are like red, green, blue. And so sensory perception is kind of like as if every consciousness is like a vacuum or has a sort of gravitational pull. And everywhere we go, the senses enter us, you know, as if we are, <clears throat> we are like, a, I don't want to say we're an empty vessel that the world fills up, but I would say it's like, it's like you're holding a cup and every environment you go into or a bowl, let's say a wooden bowl, and every moment you go into this bowl is filled by sensory perception and now the question is coming to a point where we are wondering about what is holding this bowl and this is what distinction uh, um, uh, suggests the distinction between the analytical philosopher and the continental philosopher when I speak I, I am speaking uh, with a significance and honor for continental philosophy what that means is the mystery of language is putting the species in such an unknown position that it is very hard to just say that it's just the outer realms you know why because the world enters our eyes and then it shifts and then we act upon it in our inner realms and then free will is emergent something I've written in the description of the video that man's communicator 
uh, is the most advanced communication of the universal sign. We have been through physical living. And now more than anything, ever since the introduction of language, if you think about how long the universe has been, for example, from the Earth until now, we're considering 4.5 billion years of uh, evolution. Uh, that, means, that means in some sense, this world has been 4.5 billion years, this planet has been 4.5 billion years in the making especially with the consideration of our evolutionary intent to move in the space-time continuum. So I am that person in history saying that the species played games of a physical nature. Through the emergence of language, which compared to the vastness of, uh, of the time of the planet, it, it's like language uh, arrived yesterday, in accord, if you uh, compare to the <coughs> length of... Uh, you know the evolution on the planet so now we need the advancement of communication which means we have played the games of violent animals we played there been there done that we have in some sense uh, worked physically and the type of civilization we have built probably in the future <clears throat> AI and robotics will do a lot of the labor. So in the future, inevitably, human beings will be left with the, having a creative value if technology is doing all the physical labor. <clears throat> you know, so in some sense, the non-physical work is, is left to the human mind. For this episode, I chose this specific picture because I, to me, this is the feeling I get when I think about how communication advances. In some sense, the presence of intelligence surpasses the personalities that have accepted the defeat of the world that we're in once. You know, the greatest performance of the temporary is to retaliate against extinction. Do you see? That means I was thinking about my life and I'm like, okay, I'm here for a hundred years, let's say, you know, the life cycle of the, the lifespan of the human being, you know, but how long will the species be here and who is caring for how the species walks into the void, how it walks into the unknown? You know, in the future, there will there may come events that the species is not ready for, right? We think about like the movie, for example, Independence Day, right? In, in the movie Independence Day, extraterrestrials pretty much attack Earth, violent extraterrestrials and all of humanity is like yo we're celebrating our independence day and for the first time humanity jo joins physically in retaliation to the uh, off-planet invasion in that film right now i thought what if there is an invasion that is on a mental level that means that imagine the extraterrestrial is invisible you know or even if the extraterrestrial is visible let's say extraterrestrials arrive that they don't have a mouth and they don't have ears they're just eyes and a face okay these extraterrestrials could potentially be shifted uh, 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 like what I'm saying is like the species even needs to be needs to advance to such a degree that if there is a mental invasion uh, off-planet invasion we can retaliate we can respond and so the advanced communicator is pretty much using wielding the ability of consciousness of attention i am telling you we're living at a time now where people don't carry swords and shields back in the day they had to why because anybody could kill you at any time you know a simple disagreement could start war but now we don't carry that of course we carry our phones instead of swords on our belt you know but the whole idea is it is our attention and I don't want to give the metaphor that it's a weapon. Really, the mind is a tool. What you use it for. If you use a tool to hurt people, it becomes a weapon. If you use a tool to help people, it becomes an instrument of salvation.
and you know <clears throat> which human being on this earth doesn't want to live in an advanced reality it is our purpose that means if reality was already advanced there would be nothing to do but because there is unknown variables the eyes of knowledge uh, pierce through So, what will the arrival of the advanced communicators look like? So, you know, we as people, we have a perception on the world. <clears throat> In our inner realms, we can speed it up or slow it down. You know, the moment I remember seeing a film being fast forwarded or a film being rewinded, I pretty much did that on a VCR back in the day. <laughs> And some people are going to be like, VCR? Mr. Within, how many lifetimes ago is the VCR? <laughs> but I will tell you <clears throat> that the moment I realized that the mind can engage the future and the mind can use its past to engage the future in an incredible way, <clears throat> that means a person can look at the world, close their eyes, and in their inner realms, fathom as if fast forward 100 years, fast forward uh, 200 years, fast forward 300 years, fast forward. And the mind will give probabilities. The mind has no choice. Once a question is raised, the attention engages, and then there comes the new ideology, new vision. In my, uh, there is a vision, I haven't been too descriptive of this, like I haven't shared the details of this, but there is a vision, guys. Every time I come to give these talks, there is a vision in my inner realms. Not every time, <clears throat> but there is a vision. I see my inner realms, I pretty much become really emotional, and then I feel a new archetype emerged, and then I come to give the talk. Um, the vision I see in my inner realms is imagine an earth where there is no people, nothing. You know, it's just a rock, no civilization, no infrastructure, even no, uh, you can say, even no creatures, you know. And in this vision, a light at a ridiculous speed lands on earth. And then many other lights land on earth afterwards. And what it means is that we are preparing civilization. Right now, civilization 1.0, I would say we're not advanced communicators yet. People are fighting over a language right now. You know, the advanced communicator can observe language. That means we should be at a point where language doesn't touch us, you know, but language is being the everything of our life right now, you know? That means you go and tell someone, let's say someone's drawing something, and you go tell them, yo, your art, your painting is like t tragic, terrible, right? And, uh, you know, right now we're at a point where that painter, that artist is going to be like, oh my God, I'm going to let myself be defined by this language and feel terrible. Do you see? Rather than the artist being as if everything in nature has its own space, every flower has the space to grow, and so does the human mind. We are 8 billion flowers and we're not meant to all be clones of the same ideology. We are the freedom of the garden of existence. And many mystics knew that the moment you accept the world, you become the world. In my inner realms, upon fast-forwarding uh, the current civilization that we're in, I see human beings start noticing things. We're probably going to go through a 200 to 300 year phase of stumbling as we discover the new uh, nature of man, you know. And so when we realize that language is pretty much we're on a rock in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by emptiness, a sort of galactic island, and on this 
uh, island as our eyes have uh, appeared we have we have landed as our eyes have landed here <clears throat> what can man do man creates the world that means you have to survive in the void and so after you have survived how about your species I feel everybody cares for the species you look at society how many people are trying to fit into society and you ask why why are people trying to fit into society? Because our loneliness commands us to do so. Because our solitude is a reason why. You know, it's as if like, if, if we were meant to be solipsists, there would be nobody in the universe. <clears throat> it would only be us. And when our eyes closed, the film of reality would end. But because we sleep, <clears throat> you know, this is how solipsism is in some sense kind of debunked by the nature of how we sleep and there is still existence and then we wake up you know and in the dream state what is the most fascinating thing that happens in the dream state your body's in the bed uh, existentially but your consciousness is experientially in the body that the mind generates in the dream state dreams are like uh, uh, our visions of a, of a different life you know it's as if right now we're inside the sphere when a person dreams they're dreaming out, uh, I would say either on the edge of the sphere or in the outside of the dream, outside of the sphere the inquiry of the individual towards advancing communication it's going to be awakenings what that means is human beings uh, they are conditioned you know, I don't want to say we are sheep, but the world is like our shepherd, you know. The world is in some sense guiding man's attention. And so with the emergence of the free will, for the first time we can move before the environment moves us. To be an advanced communicator, <clears throat> and of course I'm just one person sharing this idea. <sighs> Think of the modalities that perception uh, can exist in. That means imagine rather than we're in one world, There is four possibilities of the world. That means the concept of the world is the self. The context of the world uh, is the world pretty much. Excuse me, the context to that self is the world. <clears throat> so if we were to look at self-world as a dualistic filter and, and axis, <clears throat> then we would pretty much look at the self and we'd be like, okay, there is either a known self in a known world there is either uh, an unknown self in an unknown world. There is either a known self in an unknown world or an unknown self in a known world. The moment the species finds a response to all these four possibilities of consciousness and if we can build a civilization that allows for the psychology of these four uh, and these four are everything guys you don't understand it's like when, when a person looks at philosophy the philosophers are explorers of the inner realms you know <clears throat> in the same sense you would say the scientific mind is the exploration of the outer realm if we can find uh, a contentment with how our self is unknown and the world is known uh, if we can find the contentment with how our self is known and the world is unknown we in some sense activate the possibility to find ourselves in a world that is completely known and th the self is completely known <clears throat> I feel this will happen in 3600 years <laughs> but um, that's just me <laughs> And to understand the unknown self and the unknown world, this is beyond individualism. So it's kind of like we have a singular body in front of our eyes. Everybody is part of the same server, <clears throat> the same public physical server. 
behind our eyes, everybody has their own private subjective server. So in front of our eyes, one common objective server. Behind our eyes, uh, every person has a subjective server. What that means is every person is, uh, even though they're in a physical world, they are seeing the world that their eyes permits. That means based on what kind of memories you, you have attained, based on uh, what kind of experiences and decisions you have made, uh, everybody's ears are actually uh, even though we hear the same words, but the images that arise for those words are not the same. This means that we are 8 billion uh, worlds inside one world. Now, <clears throat> the advanced communicator, you can think of hunter-gatherer tribes. And hunter-gatherer tribes back in the day in the outer realms, what, what, would, what would they do? Pretty much, you know, <clears throat> the women would gather, the men would go hunt, right? And I don't know, maybe there were tribes where the women would hunt and the, uh, you know, men would gather, you know. For example, you look at the lion. <laughs> like the lioness archetype. But anyways, hunter gathers. What did that mean? That means we assembled into groups and these groups went on exhibitions into the unknown forests of mankind and we came back with findings. So it's pretty much like if you ever see how a bird builds a nest, the bird finds a, a little a piece of a branch or whatever and then takes it to its nest, then comes back, finds another piece, takes it to its nest, right? So that's pretty much the hunter gatherer archetype. <clears throat> you can say where um, <clears throat> where we in some sense went to find something and bring it back so we could update everybody's life imagine you being a hunter-gatherer back in the day and you in some sense went and found blueberries or blackberries right you found a blackberry and you were like yo whose phone is this not Joe? <laughs> you found blackberry like the blackberries the fruit and you uh, in some sense take this fruit to the tribe right and the tribe has never seen berries and everybody is shocked everybody's like no way we could have ate berries this whole time so now i would say it's important to become the hunter gatherers of the inner realms that means it's not about finding something in front of your eyes and sharing it with the world it's about landing what is behind your eyes into the outer realms with a discretion of how the outer realms has walked, how the outer realms has moved. You see, I would say when it comes to communication, a person can experience a blissfulness where their mind, actually the speed of their inner realms, uh, uh, like the, 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 their speed increases. Or I would say the velocity of psychology. That means the mind kind of directs and chooses a direction and everything kind of moves where the attention is going. The exploration of attention in a world that appears infinite you know sometimes I think it's hilarious existence you know <laughs> you know some people say is this the cosmos a joke and I'll be like even if it isn't it you will make you laugh why because it's as if like the universe is so vast so infinite right and in a small part of it you know just temporary creatures have emerged for a little while you know you know, it's as if you're, you're, you know, if you're someone who believed in God, it's as if you're looking at God and being like, yo, God, what, what kind of system is this, right? There is infinite opportunity to explore, but we're temporary. <laughs> you know, it's like, who, it's like, why is the universe so big, you know? And so beyond our own eyes, we will realize the universe is not actually fine-tuned to the human being. There's a multidimensionality at work. We have, we have adjusted to the bigger picture rather than the bigger picture adjusting to us.
you know, um, in my uh, inner visions, uh, I thought about, in some sense, how we have, uh, for example, doctors, you know, and how there was a time, uh, excuse me, how we have hospitals, and how there was a time where there was no hospital, Do you know, it was just like, let's say, doctors just soloing it out, you know. <clears throat> And then there came a decision, a bunch of doctors grouped up and they're like, yo, let's make a center, let's make a headquarters of health, you know, for our health. And so it was as if like, uh, <coughs> I would say the same thing kind of follows where <coughs> the advanced communicators, which we were in some sense were awakening to, you can say. Not only will there be an association of advanced communicators in the future, which I've termed that as School of Athens 2.0, the great network of the advancement of communication. That means for the first time, we want to, as a species, utilize the resources behind our eyes, not just in front of it. That means if you are a human being who has a sort of moment uh, where you have found yourself capable of expression more than anything. The greatest service to the world is uh, intelligent activity. In the future, I can totally see an advanced communicator becoming a public servant in the sense that we have, for example, uh, cops, uh, police, we have paramedics, we have firemen, right? And imagine in these situations, right, when the policeman, the fireman, the paramedic, um, every time they're dispatched, there is an advanced communicator also dispatched alongside them. And the advanced communication is, uh, advanced communicator is there, probably a very, <coughs> by a multilingual person and the advanced communicator will go and assist the authorities and public and other public servants in the sense of communicating because we're not just a physical creature every person yeah, is is uh, is standing in front of themselves and they're also standing uh, as a participant in a civilization right and there can be modalities of communication that means right now I would say of course uh, firemen police officers and uh, paramedics they are like the closest thing we have to angels right but of course there is the human nature <coughs> and so if there is an advanced community Communicator, the advanced communicator is there to be a guardian of the psychology of the citizen as it is being helped by the outer realm guardians. So what I mean by that is that the advanced communicator is here to perceive a multidimensional perspective where rather than we judge things and uh, break things, we in some sense notice that there's different dimensions. Advanced communicators will not only be the salvation of humanity, they will be those who will shield humanity from the ignorance found in dualistic perception. Right now, we're like good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, like, dislike, like, dislike, like, dislike, hate, love, hate, love, hate, love. You see what I mean? We are caught in a duality as a species. And so the advanced communicator is the being who realizes that just like you can hold an object in your hand uh, and look at it from multiple ways, in some sense, you can take a subject and look at it in a multiple ways. That means, imagine somebody says they're an artist, right? Then the question comes, what kind of artist, you know? And then you, you find out that the artist to himself is a completely different archetype than how people perceive him, for example, right? And so this administration, or you can say management, between the tensions of our outer realm and our inner realm, when we realize that it's not about even just saying a lot of things, you know, it's not about saying even every thought, you know, which makes you an advanced communicator. The whole point is that you actually utilize the consciousness you're given. That means it's like uh, awareness to existence is like free imagination. Existence is like imagination. You don't have to imagine it's already there, you know. So in some sense, we use all the resources. I would say the advanced communicator is like if the whole species is on an 
island and instead of unknown waters it's unknown space surrounding us the advanced communicators are those who are wondering about the significance of the survival of not just an individual but a collective system when will we care for the collective guys Whoever you are listening to me, when else can you uh, serve the world? You know, it's like only when your physical manifestation in this realm, you have the opportunity to serve that which, that which was beyond you. And when I say serve that was beyond you, that which is beyond you, I'm not saying go serve an agenda of an ideology, right? Because let me tell you, there's so many agendas, there's so many ways. I can, I can literally, all the institutions we find in our societies are institutions that are declaring in, to some degree their own righteousness, their own, own correctness. I can't, I can't, like, how would I tell you? <clears throat> in this world, the youth have to be, be careful. I will say this, and I, if there's young people listening, it's, this is really important. You have to be careful uh, that uh, there will be those in the world who are ahead of you and they may manipulate the context you enter you know what that means is um, we're not the first here and civilization is the echo of the vision of our ancestors whether good or bad <clears throat> it's as if civilization is a 4.5 billion year old science project and should we care for it you know and if we care for it, what does that mean? Does that mean blind love where we're trying to make everything equal? Does that mean we want to go into a blind utopia, you know, that is ignoring chaotic dimensions for growth? To be honest, the reason uh, there will be advanced communicators and many, many children will be born and they will fascinate the world. Uh, you know, I'm just waiting. You know, I think pretty much when I get old, like right now, I'm, I'm giving these talks, but when I get old, I'm just waiting to see the future generations, you know, and how their eyes, you know, run into the world. You know, in Vedic thought, there's this concept of Leela, L-E-E-L-A. Leela means a play. That means um, it's like the yogis back in the day, they looked at reality and they're like, yo, uh, look at these forces in play. <laughs> it was like a theater performance, you know. It's as if like existence is a theater and experience is the actor. And so we... Uh, are an actor when it comes to bigger systems but when it comes to our own body we are the director right so the actor like imagine a film set <clears throat> and the director is not on set the director is not on the film set <clears throat> and the director is uh, in some sense in the sidelines okay and so the actor is there and now imagine the actor doesn't know the director is watching you know <clears throat> and so the actor begins improvising you know and if the actor improvises off script the director interferes you know <clears throat> if it's not what the director wants right but if there was no director think of it as if it's like a play like a Shakespeare like a Shakespearean play or something the actor has the freedom the actor is the director right so I would say when you look in front of your eyes <clears throat> um, uh, or I would say it this way behind in front of your eyes you're a passenger uh, behind your eyes you are a pilot it's in front of your eyes you're an actor behind your eyes you're the director So, where does this take us? This takes us pretty much into 8 billion human beings who have an inner space, an inner verse. <coughs> uh, in some sense, utilizing what's in their awareness and sharing it. There's this poet by the name of Rumi. He says, before death takes away all that is given, give away all there is to give as if we can't carry anything with us even alexander the great 
you know, he was, um, uh, back in the day, it was like ceremony where when somebody, when a person, a warrior, let's say a warrior passed away, <clears throat> they would put the body of the warrior, like with the arms kind of crossed, you know, <clears throat> Uh, on a boat and they would set the boat uh, aflame and the boat will be sent uh, in the ocean, you know. So Alexander the Great um, had advised his men that uh, when he dies, they keep his, the, his corpse, like they leave the arms of his corpse open, you know. And people in the in this in the town back in the day were like, why? Why was Alexander the Great's uh, arms open uh, for his corpse when he was like being moved by the boat, you know, a burning boat in the sea, right? And the answer is that Alexander the Great said, you can't take anything with you. Do you see, guys, why it makes sense to give in this world? Because we can't take anything with us, <laughs> even if there's continuity. I mean, you could be a philosopher and say, like Socrates. Socrates, um, he was asked. <clears throat> you know, like he, pretty much he was sentenced to drink poison or live without honor, so he decides to drink the poison and in his, he gives this speech to his disciples before he drinks the poison and he says, I will either go to a place where there is no Socrates or I will go to a place where all the questions that I have wondered about in this life, I will access their answer. see I am not saying it's possible to get rid of good and bad because as long as there's the cosmological design uh, of light on I call it the on off switch effect <coughs> as long as there is light and darkness duality will remain it's just the ability of the human being to perceive not just one, one sort of light and one sort of darkness, you know. It's as if in the future, uh, I've said it humorously, in an advanced civilization, if somebody does something wrong, they'll be like, yo, <clears throat> this is like the level of, I don't know, 7,211 of evil. Do you know what I mean? So that means rather than it just being one thing, we're actually bringing an infinite context to all the ideas behind our eyes that are acting as if godly nouns, you know? And of course, the human being, we communicate, right? If, if life was, when you look at, uh, you know, and you can say in, in a sense, when you look at the meaning of life, let's say you're someone and you, you exist and you're like, yo, why do I exist? What is this? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's as if because there is others, there's the clue. We are here to participate and in some sense be a lead to the emergence of collective events. And, you know, it, just like this picture shows, the advanced communicator, it has not forgotten the sky. It's very hard to speak about power and the listener to not get an ego about it, you know? And I would say those who become ultimately powerful, they are those who have reached the end of their power uh, in the sense that they have reached the bottom of the spectrum of power. That means the most powerless people understand power. But those who have had power from the beginning, they will not understand it until they lose it. You know, that means you even see it in a lot of entrepreneurs and their life stories where the entrepreneur had nothing, came from nothing, and that's why the entrepreneur valued everything. When we realize we came from a state where we were just moving in nature like an animal, imagine like gazelle level of consciousness, you know, <clears throat> now we have reached the point where once the human being accepts their temporary life, that means you accept that you are temporary. That means we're candles that will melt one day. The light of consciousness will vanish, <clears throat> at least to the candle. There is nothing to fear because the system is designed. It's designed in a way where the, all beginnings have an ending. 
And so the biggest question in philosophy is, does the ending have a beginning? That means it's as if some people say the ending began. <laughs> You see, I think it's about discretion. I think we are 8 billion human beings that each have a different DNA. Every person has a different communication style. <clears throat> Every person has a, 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 their eyes have walked in the world in a certain way, have journeyed into the space-time continuum. <clears throat> People have a different memory archive. That means it's like if you're a gentle person, you ha your future self will have more uh, gentle memories to work with if you were a chaotic and violent person or you went through some sort of experience of savageness it's as if that's a memory you know and you can choose think of it as if <clears throat> uh, the, uh, there's a democracy of ideology there's a democracy for memories and if, if you can say the archetype is like the sum of the memories There is nothing to fear about existence, it's just here. Existence really, its all its purpose is to exist. It's experience that can do something while it's here. And so I'm just that person saying, uh, what is the greatest thing that we can do in front of our eyes? <clears throat> and what is the greatest thing we can do behind our eyes? And my conclusion, firm conclusion is that Behind our eyes, the advanced communication, and the most advanced communication uh, you can say is the concept of moksha, nirvana, enlightenment. <clears throat> and you can say in front of your eyes, the most advanced thing we can do is build an advanced civilization. So I'm just, I'm like a person who can't wait to see an advanced civilization and wants to speed up the process, but I also realize nature has to uh, walk through its own flames. I want to <clears throat> read uh, for um, the listeners something, uh, a message I wrote on a Facebook post. I can't find it. <laughs> you know, it's as if we are drops. Every individual human being is a drop. And these drops will evaporate. But if we can somehow the drops can become a stream and the streams can become a river and then the river successfully goes through the 90 degree shift of the waterfall and then eventually finds itself in the ocean the current imagine a river entering an ocean the current of an individualized let's say collective movement and a sort of rhythm right it's as if our it our, uh, our intelligence is, is a rhythm is like a current and when we go beyond the physical and beyond the sensory this current goes back into the ocean right so it doesn't mean that there is no individuality uh, beyond our uh, physical life I would say it, it, it's a sort of implication <coughs> that um, we are like the ocean and uh, individualism see it as a drop or see it as a iceberg and when this iceberg melts uh, in some sense there there is only the ocean here that means it's as if this whole time that we have been creatures we all consider that we're energetic creatures and energy cannot be created or destroyed so the energy transforms right and I would say the concept uh, in secular society of, of energy is the closest thing that comes to the idea of the soul that means if you make consciousness a type of energy it's as if like how the Buddhists perceive a transmigratory soul going from life to life to life to life you know as if the energy has nothing else to do uh, you can say because it can't be created or destroyed all it can do is change 
and that's one thing that we perhaps have not considered <clears throat> as uh, as human beings that there is no death existentially I mean I, I don't mean the body I mean just like energy can't die but experientially yeah there's a lot of points points of access into the realm Um, <clears throat> I encourage the listeners to, uh, in the chat section, to ask questions and only write comments that are necessary. You know. Imagine, <clears throat> I would say, what is not advanced communication is solipsistic communication. You know. What I mean by that is that um, when we realize the world is bigger than our eyes, the psychology attains a sort of humility. And so that's when karma heals. Anybody who is having bad luck, I'm telling you, it's because the idea of yourself in the inner realms is trying to be larger than the world in front of your eyes. You know, I would say it's not about, <clears throat> you know, uh, living faster than the world. I would say it's like, walking with the world as if the planet the guy in mind as some scholars speak about is like your friend as if the per the being that is uh, manifest the existential creature that has emerged it's, it's like literally the soul has come to meet the world soon i think something everybody should do is they should go to a park or somewhere where there's a grassland and they should put one of their hands, they should squat down and put their hand, uh, the palm of one of their hands on the grass, you know? And in some sense, keep your hand on the grass until you can accept the world and then thank the world and begin. And I will tell you, your karma will change instantly. In my own uh, school of thought, I don't have only the archetype of the advanced communicator, which I use. I also use the archetype of the pilot of consciousness. Um, there was a time that, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, what's the way I can say this? I began seeing civilization like a sphere. And those who are there to assist inside the sphere are the advanced communicators. <clears throat> and uh, you can see the sphere that is holding all of civilization to be like an airplane or how B Marshall McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller would say that we're on spaceship Earth <clears throat> literally the planet's like a spaceship <laughs> moving in outer space and so we're all crew members and so I am dividing the crew members into the advanced communicators and the pilots the pilot is isolated from everybody else uh, except the co-pilots, you know, and in some sense the pilot navigates the plane of existence outside, you know, but inside the advanced communicators are there to assist the passengers of civilization. So if you're an advanced communicator, you should pretty much be incredibly preferenceless. You observe reality, you observe the duality, uh, the axis of duality found in the moment, and then if you uh, are conscious, you communicate pro different probabilities of a movement. You know, it's like we've we've surpassed the point where it's like truth or not. You know, it's like what is this? For how long are we gonna play whack-a-mole with truth? You know, it's like yo, is this truth? Yeah. You know, let's hit it. You know, is that truth? Yeah. Let's go for it. You know, it's like it's like any time. It's like right now, truth is one of the biggest uh, markets. If you notice. You know, like when it comes to self-help, a lot of these self-help, the self-help industry is like a billion dollar industry, right? <clears throat> and so the self-help industry, the concept of all these books of self-help, it's in some sense man's relationship with the truth of nature. That means I can say anything, but I will realize at the end of this talk, I am just being here. Do you see the simplicity of nature?
everybody is trying to improve their lives, aren't they? Everybody, every individual <clears throat> is in some sense trying to perceive something more. You know, I remember a sentence I wrote, the first sentence that I, I remember I, I wrote that I felt it was truly for me. <clears throat> and I wrote it and I uh, taped it on the wall. I wrote the sentence, I don't want to live in a world that looks the same the next day. None of us want to live in a world that looks the same day, the same the next day. Why? Because then there is no progress. So consciousness allows from uh, consciousness allows a recognition of progress by, in some sense, how we have moved so far in the space-time continuum. And you pretty much use all the like like a survivor in a galactic island. You use everything accessible to get by, you know, and to get the species by. And so, uh, I, I want to say something about the picture, guys. I found a good metaphor for it. Uh, you see the skeletons. The skeletons are the ego. The advanced communicator is the being that has found the significance of direct experience before ideology. And so we want to activate, you know, an 8 billion direct experiential movement where people honor experience whatever experience it is life is too short to have enemies life is too short to hate anything life is too short to uh, carry a heavy uh, of the weight of the past as if like a backpack with like 20 books 20 textbooks in it and the person's like yo why am I carrying this I should have you know <laughs> Use the vehicle. Yeah. By the way, questions are welcome in the chat section. Uh, and actually, guys, I need a quick intermission, a couple minute intermission. I'll be right back.
Okay. You know, guys, I, I was thinking that <coughs> I was thinking that um, any communication can be advanced. Let's say we want to create a method out of this, okay? And a method means you can use it anytime. So let's say that when we look at communication, the most important thing about communication is that it's happening between people <coughs> and points of conscious activity, intelligent points, right? So you can say when a person is alone, their mind is still intelligent, it's still an expressive thing, but it's communicating to themselves. And you can say that when the person, when there's more than one intelligent point, let's say there's two points, point A, person A, and then we have point B, person B. So in some sense, when it comes to advancing the communication of person A, there's only one, uh, there's one outer realm and one inner realm to advance. But when it comes to <coughs> advancing the communication of point A and B, of person A and B, right? It's as if it's not just about advancing one outer realm, but advancing two simultaneous inner realms, right? And when people communicate, what do they do? That means let's, let's take the cultural significance of communication, uh, excuse me, cultural connotations of communication aside. <coughs> and we're just like, okay, there's a world behind the eyes of one person and there's a world behind the eyes of another person. And when they communicate, they are co-creating. That means the advancement of individual communication is co-creative communication. Somebody in the chat uh, in the chat section, uh, Dan. Dan says, "I'm curious how your ideas will evolve with time, and how your way of being will evolve to reflect them." <coughs> yeah. So here's the thing: the evolution of ideas is action, right? So the greatest evolution of the, all the ideas I have, in in some sense, to after speaking about them, acting them out, I would say. But if I go back to point A and point B, <coughs> pretty much if person A is just talking through the inner realm of person A, that means that they don't see person B even though they're talking to person B, let's say. <coughs> but person A doesn't consider that person B has their own reality. The ego indirectly acts out its own tyranny. That means the communicator doesn't have an obligation of having to understand the other person. But I would say the advanced communicator has to have an ability to be able to, for a moment, like a video game, put pause on your own perception and to notice the perception of others and how the world is also starting behind people's eyes. Like this is really <coughs> the essence of philosophy where every philosopher I have looked at is pretty much like a human being who's in, in the world and trying to figure it out. Now imagine it's not just two people. Then the advanced communicator has to consider the inner realms of as many people there are in the room. And so the two points of communication need to establish commonality. The commonality means universals in each other's inner worlds. What a universal is something that is true 
uh, wherever you are. That means like the color blue is a universal. Not just the color blue, like all the colors. Yeah. There is no secondary, it's just there, right? So let's say uh, we have 8 billion uh, points of intelligent communication. These 8 billion human beings have to have an ability to step out of their own inner realm and begin acknowledging a collective uh, meaning behind the civilization, right? They call this ethos. Ethos is pretty much like the inspiration of a collective, you can say, through narrative. So the challenge of advancing civilization is advancing communication beyond its individual uh, domain. So what that means is it's like two video games. It's like the or two films. Our mind is playing is is is, is like a film over like the outer realm is like an existential film, and our mind and our psychology is like an experiential film. And these two films are overlaid, right? <coughs> Even the Buddha says. Buddha says on um, the nature of objective phenomena is empty guys I totally forgot to update the thumbnail of this video I'm, I'm too embarrassed to continue anyway <laughs> So again, back to <coughs> the notion of the ethos, uh, 8 billion inner realms, uh, one outer realm. Uh, Buddha said the nature of objects is empty, meaning that our mind uh, imposes or projects the nature of phenomena. Right now, this object in front of me is just an object. But suddenly, when the mind is in the room, this object becomes a coffee cup. You see, or this other object becomes a laptop. And really it's kind of like an inanimate realm where we're choosing how to animate. And the common denominator of 8 billion inner realms and the outer realm is firstly survival. Survival <coughs> is a reason why many people work together because they want a win-win rather than one person lose, the, uh, one person win. Aside from survival, it's the quality of experience. That means we don't want to just continue in the world miserably. We want to continue in the realm with the joy of a fascination that we're here. We are attending the great existential event. Any human being, or I would say any being that is conscious <coughs> in the Milky Way sector, in uh, let's say or, uh, Gaia on planet Earth, it's as if we are, we have already attended, as if the ticket has been paid for beforehand. 
And so in this event, we choose how in some sense the songs of an advanced civilization will be sung, right? Because to me, I'm like, what does everyone want? <clears throat> and you know, most people just want to get by, right? But imagine if we could increase, we could create an advanced civilization where even if an individual made a uh, mistake, the advanced civilization recycles the mistake. Imagine an, uh, you had eight billion, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, fam um, eight billion members of uh, your family, and each member took care, took care of your blind spot. Right? That would mean everybody's blind spot is being taken care of by everybody. And, I mean, I'm just thinking about realistically, like, what's the coolest thing that human beings can do, right? We either build things in the outer realms or watch them get destroyed, and in the inner realms, we free will select what it communicates. <clears throat> you know, I would like the listeners of, the listeners of this channel to experience two days where one day they are completely silent. That means anything happens, you don't say anything. <clears throat> you know, you're just a silent viewer of the realm. Try to experience a day like that, and then one day, anything that happens, uh, go towards communicating. And wonder about the result of the karma of the day. You know, I'm kind of trying to uh, <clears throat> bring forth uh, a sort of a scientific method, like I'm trying to use uh, the scientific method but for mystical experience right where it's as if we want to use the scientific method to discover our karma right not that uh, uh, not only limited to a sort of mathematical domain of interpretation but what reality means to the cultural entity you know society has a very brilliant story you know to it and it's a story that we don't know 100%, you know, like as the word history kind of says, his story. What that means is it's written by the winners. So beyond language, there will be just direct experience. And uh, I guess this is a good point for me to go into a quote tunnel. A quote tunnel, for those who are new, is... Uh, I pretty much read a bunch of quotes from people in the past to see how their eyes looked at the world. The theme for this episode, I would ch I'm choosing authenticity. The theme for the quote tunnel. Peter Guber says truth is a point of view, but authenticity can't be faked. <clears throat> Layla Ali says authenticity is very important. Be true to oneself. John Legend, soul is about authenticity. Soul is about finding things in your life that are real and pure. He means like the music genre, of course. <clears throat> John Hawk says my fear now is cliche of complacency, of not being able to feel authenticity in myself and those around me. Meredith Monk says the inner voice has both gentleness and clarity, so to get to authenticity, you really keep going down to the bone, to the honesty and the in inevitability of something.
Janice uh, Joplin says, don't compromise yourself. You're all you've got. Bra Barbara de uh, Angelis says, it takes a lot of courage to be the same person on the outside that you are on the inside. This is so true because really, um, because there is an artificial ability to project the type of self you are. I would say most people, who, uh, if you're someone who distrusts society, most likely you're not uh, giving it your all, pretty much you're not being authentic in the moment if you distrust them. It's kind of like people we like, we open up to, people we dislike or distrust, we don't open up to. We lock ourselves. That means there's a lot of people living on the planet where they are on an ideological lockdown, you can say not a physical lockdown, an ideological lockdown in the sense that if you distrust society, why should you uh, try uh, behave in a trusting manner? You know? Trustworthy manner. <sighs> Peter, oh no, I read that. Mother Teresa, honesty and transparency make you vulnerable. Be honest and transparent anyway. Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek says authenticity is about imperfection and authenticity is, very, is a very human quality. To be authentic is to be at peace with your imperfections. The, greatest, the great leaders are not the strongest. They are the ones who are honest about their weaknesses. The great leaders are not the smartest. They are the ones who admit how much they don't know. The great leaders can't do everything. They are the ones who look to others to help them. Great leaders don't see themselves as great. They see themselves as human. And I would just add another line. You see your species as great. You know, there is, um, in, in earlier talks of mine, in 2015, I said the love of the species. That means right now, people are in love, let's say, with individuals. Or some people <clears throat> of a narcissistic nature, they're in love with themselves, you know. But I will tell you, when you realize the future of the species is your greater self, is your higher self. That means some people in the New Age community, their higher self is, <coughs> their higher self is like, you know, uh, kind of like standing above them, right? But I would tell you the higher self of the species, if in the future the drops become all the same ocean, is the future. Our higher self is, uh, at least this is my, uh, you could say, unique school of thought, <coughs> where to me, I don't see, uh, 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 how would I say it, I don't see any angels and demons. You know, I don't see <coughs> spirit guides and those concepts, but I see that the only in intuition is like the collective future self that has transitioned beyond time. When I say it is beyond time, I mean beyond change. That means imagine as there was an advanced civilization, <clears throat> and there was a civilization, this civilization is like, yo, I'm gonna go become advanced. And this advanced civilization reached a certain point where it was updating and changing faster than the speed of light. <clears throat> this advanced civilization would become timeless because time is how we perceive change in light. So it would be invisible. So the invisible is timeless. It doesn't, you can, there's nothing of it that changes. Uh, nothing of it that can be seen to change. Eckhart Tolle says, only the truth of who you are, if realized, will set you free. Carl Jung says the privilege of a lifetime is to become who you truly are. And I would say this is the path of the advanced communicator. <clears throat> you know, eight billion different DNAs, eight billion different instruments awaiting the great orchestra of uh, an advanced civilization would just be a great orchestra.
poet at the end of time <coughs> grabbed his pen to share the shadow of the timeless on the empty page. The animals on a rock in the middle of nowhere upon noticing emptiness became gods for what else can you do when your attention is being all of you you know <clears throat> it's as if the individual human being raised its hand and the universe responded do you have a question and the human being said I have the question of questions where are you you know I will tell you that there was this picture <coughs> of uh, on the Sistine Chapel it's called the creation of Adam Michelangelo drew it <clears throat> and pretty much Adam is on earth oblivious his elbow just leaned against his knee having no clue and the other side you see God's hand reaching uh, with the uh, 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 angels beside him you know? I would say that in order to unite uh, all ideological systems uh, of secular and non-secular uh, thought or approach to reality. God is the future self, the collective future self. If you're secular, it's the greatest expression of 8 billion human beings. If you're religious, it's as if you trust the future. You know, this is, the, I may be uh, that strange person and <laughs> that uncommon person in uh, civilization who said this, but the future is here. It's just the past that is late to the pardon. <clears throat> my father, actual father, shared a story where he was talking to my grandfather in his youth, to my grandfather in his youth. And my father <clears throat> uh, shared his spiritual perspective to my grandfather. And my grandfather was a religious man uh, from Iran. He looked at my father and he said, everything is in like the holy book. <laughs> You know, and he said, and he was pretty much saying, everything is already here. It's just in some sense reshaping. As if, if energy this whole time has nowhere to go, what has changed? As a final statement for this episode, <clears throat> or actually, let me read a few more quotes from the quote tunnel. <clears throat> Adam Grant says authenticity means erasing the gap between what you firmly believe inside and what you reveal to the outside world. That means synchronization of the inner realms and the outer realms. Merle Dandridge says authenticity, living your truth, kindness, these are necessary virtues. <clears throat> Isaac Newton, there are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than in any profane history. Okay. Marianne Williamson, enlightenment is the key to everything and it is the key to intimacy because it is the goal of true authenticity. Bernard Williams, if there is one theme in all my work, it's about authenticity and self-expression. It's the idea that some things are, in some real sense, really you, or express what you and others aren't. Tony Rob. oh no, that's something else. Green, brown, um, I don't know if I read this, but I'll read it again. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world, our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. 
Soren Kierkegaard, the most common form of despair is not being who you are. Ben Okri says, the most authentic thing about us is our capacity to create, to overcome, to endure, to transform, to love, and to be greater than our suffering. <clears throat> Charles R. Swindoll, I know of nothing more valuable when it comes to the all-important virtue of authenticity than simply being who you are. The great Michael Jordan. Authenticity is about being true to who you are, even when everyone around you wants you to be someone else. <clears throat> that took me a while to learn, guys. You know, some people are late bloomers to their own authenticity. Coco Chanel says, hard times arouse an instinctive desire for authenticity. Steve Jobs, don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. Henry David Thoreau. We are constantly invited to be who we are. Wayne Dyer, authentic empowerment. Is the knowing that you are on purpose doing God's work peacefully and harmoniously. <clears throat> Eva Hoffman, the authentic is almost never found by being pursued but there is no missing it when you are in its presence. I would say, guys, authenticity, its absence is only there when the person doesn't feel how they are being before they do anything is enough. If you don't feel you just by your sense of being is not enough, then you could say it's as if it, any person who doesn't feel enough, you will divert. You will divert from authenticity. You know, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Sometimes in social situations, especially growing up for me um, when I was alone <laughs> you know it's like you know there was I was like you have no choice but to be authentic when you're alone it's like it's a waste of energy <clears throat> to not be authentic when you're alone it's like what you are you are it's just that when people uh, as intelligent variables enter our moment of perception we are not just seeing them we're animating their potential intelligence in our psyche and if we respond to what we think rather than what is there in the moment of course their authenticity diverts it's, it's, it's as if a sub narrative uh, or a sub archetype begins moving right it's kind of like how Aristotle says <clears throat> um, those people who lie they have to remember different versions of themselves you know but if you never lie you don't have to remember anything because honesty is really <clears throat> Elizabeth Kubler Ross we think sometimes we're only drawn to the good but we're actually drawn to the authentic we like people who are real more than those who hide their true selves under layers of artificial niceties. Exactly. So civilization will advance when we realize it is our birthright to advance. Greatness is not just an opportunity. It is our birthright. That means the greatness of the species. What are we waiting for? What are we judging? How are the isms still going on? For example, racism, sexism, all of this is like, have we not noticed the gigantic emptiness around us? When a civilization does not fear the inevitable, that means imagine if 8 billion people, rather than like, oh no, we're going to go extinct, holy shit, you only live once. And you know, it's like people having that mentality. It's as if we have this mentality, okay, we're going to go extinct. And we're going to reduce the percentage of uh, extinction every day, right? <clears throat> and the expression of the authentic is the greatest uh, cavalry in that march. You know? Ed 
And believe it or not, when it comes to mysticism, oh my God, if you are uh, unauthentic or if you are acting in the inner realms and there is, you've truly, let's say, tapped into a state of uh, presence, there will be consequences. That means the inner realms, you actually enter as, think of it this way, think of it, there is an unknown world behind your eyes and then there is a known world in front of your eyes. The known world, you enter as a known self right you function as a known self in the known world but i would tell you behind your eyes from a mystical context you are actually you have to be content with your unknown self then the unknown world animates that means those people who i would say have the most <coughs> uh, uh animated inner realms you know if you're somebody who's let's say your inner realms are animated um it's as if you have you have noticed that it's you have noticed the uh, poetically the eyes of the invisible that means if we say we have a mind how can it just be a body and why does the word mind the word soul exist in the dictionary think about it why are these concepts even among us you know it's not just people who live in a world ideas live in people's minds and some people can get stuck to those ideas and live in it, right? Because that's one thing nature tells you. Nature's kind of like, yo, you think you figured it out? Guess what? Change. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, there's this joke, uh, <laughs> you know, where this, um, this Buddhist goes to this hot dog stand and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the Buddhist says to the hot dog stand owner, it's, uh, the hot dog stand owner says, what do you want? What kind of hot dog do you want? And the Buddhist says, make me one with everything. A sort of <laughs> pun, like Buddhists uh, kind of meditate to attain union. Yeah. <laughs> so then the Buddhist gives the uh, hot dog uh, stand owner, uh, let's say a 20, a bill right and then the hot dog stone owner doesn't give the change back and the buddhist is like yo where's my change and the hot dog owner says change comes from within <laughs>
And I will tell you, in my youth, it was very easy to hate anything that I made an opponent to myself. That means when I was younger, I wanted to destroy uh, the resistance that came. Like I, uh, I wanted not that I acted on it, but there was a sort of intensity. Where as if, as if, like, if imagine you have a sword and you're walking. <clears throat> somewhere you know and there's like these wines that are blocking you from entering like a part of the forest and back in the day I would say my intensity would be like instantly whatever barrier there is to kind of have a sort of pressure from the inner realms kind of respond to the outer realms but later on I realized that I am distrusting that means that's the biggest downside of power you actually are being powerful because you distrust the power that is everywhere so unless the person can start from simple perceptions of life and then cultivate complexity, uh, if you just start, if you just try to be the complex, then you fail in the complex and then you come to a simplicity you haven't been before and that becomes despair, right? So my method is like, rather than wanting so much from the world, I first see what I have, right? And as a human being, I have the biological body and I have an ability to use my voice and speech and there's also the mind, the free will that decides, right? So these are the three components, you know, kind of like a poetic body, mind, soul <coughs> bundle. You know, it's like, it's as if you get a body, you get a mind free, <laughs> you know, you get it, or you get a soul, you get a mind and body f uh, free, you know, <laughs> or it's kind of like you get a soul, you get a mind for free, but then you got to pay for the body karmically. <laughs> It's like buy one, get the other half off, you know? It's like we bought truth and then got the mind half off, you know, half off truth. You know? <laughs> <coughs> Let me tell you guys, um, Dan in the chat section uh, brings forth a good question. Dan says, how can I not be who I am? Let me tell you how. Because you are growing and changing that means if i tell you uh, do you have the same physical body as you had 10 years ago what would you say you'd be like obviously not my body's grown you know <clears throat> and now how about the mind what if 10 years passes and you're still the same person to yourself you know that's a, that's a tragedy that means as if the eyes have not realized how many more ways there was for uh attention to move in the inner realms <clears throat> those who are free there is they are pretty much at the finish line and then they work right so the way i kind of communicate is that in the inner realms i have actually experienced uh the advanced civilization in the domains of where abstraction takes place <clears throat> but in the outer realms you know what can i say you know we are still uh caught in the uh unconscious uh, movements of the linguistic simulation And whoever you are, let's say you have some power. <coughs> because advanced communication doesn't mean physic, uh, only vocally. It doesn't mean just uh, our expression of language. It just it means how our state of being is being. And in yoga, there were these, <coughs> what do you call it? The yogi would meditate, uh, the sadhu would go through towards truth, and the sadhu would eventually attain siddhis. What that means is when you become selfless and if you're truly honest and sincere, you actually begin uh, having a rhythm with uh, universal, event. Uh, what's the word? It's as if you become a fish inside a current in the ocean. And so that is a sort of power. So there are, it is really, um, in, so in, in yogic thought, they were like the yogi on its path to truth, <clears throat> in some sense will attain powers, but those powers uh, in some sense still are attachments to samsara. So what that means is if you use your power, imagine the world is a simulation, the yogic mind perceive reality as a dream, <clears throat> uh, as if truth is dreaming of its own separation. That means as if, like, right now, physical reality is like the dream of uh, Krishna or Vishnu, <laughs> you know? The yogi should not use his power <coughs> uh, insincerely. That means if you use your power just for yourself, 
the lords of karma are like, yo, what is this guy doing with this extra privilege, you know? <laughs> but you can say, if you serve, as Rabindranath Tagore says, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. I would say service is the collective evolution. That means if you're a human being and you don't serve your realm, you only serve yourself, it's as if you, uh, you miss the world that you were in. Okay, so questions are coming in. Dan says, have you ever struggled to find your pace in the inner realm? So what do you mean by pace? You mean my flow? Yeah, every time I inhale, exhale, it's like the ocean waves uh, are wiping uh, the sands on the beach. <laughs> you know <clears throat> that means I gotta the more if here's the thing if I if I if I want to communicate fast I gotta think through images <clears throat> but if I want to speak slow then I could pay attention more to uh, the sentence structure and uh, the moment in the inner realms changes you know what it is guys pretty much it's this if our minds were happening slower than the world we wouldn't notice it but because our minds are fa happening faster than the world, that means it's as if something non-physical is uh, 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 moving. Uh, I can't say really moving, but it's like something non-physical is aware before the physical moves. So in some sense, the inner realms have an instantaneity of speed, right? That means it's as if uh, people don't realize how advanced we are as a <clears throat> technology, if you saw humanity as a technology of nature as a way of nature to express <clears throat> so it's i wouldn't say i have struggled because the struggle is in every everything it's pretty much like so you can say silence I, I wouldn't use the term struggle i would say i have had turbulence so imagine if i'm a pilot uh when i'm giving these talks i'm piloting the attention of the listeners and i'm also piloting my own attention <clears throat> just like a airplane pilot you know is moving the plane and all the passengers move with it right so there has been times of course there's turbulence there was a time i was giving a talk and i was like to in such a nice rhythm then a bee literally a bee was like 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 literally close to my face and midway through the talk i'm like talking but my hands trying to like tell the bee to get out of here it's like get out of here nature not now <laughs> I would say um, I, I don't perceive a reality where there is um, inferior self and a greater self anymore. For me, I'm a presence beyond my personality. That means my I have noticed that um, there is an awareness, not consciousness, there's an awareness, which is the presence, and then the consciousness, which is conditional to form, is where the personality is. So believe it or not, I am uh, space right now talking to you in my own experience. It's like I'm, uh, my voice is coming from a field, but my body is a particle in the field. So the field is moving the particle in a certain way where uh, my voice animates. And this field is simply trust because I don't, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a very minimalistic person. You know, that means I've, uh, there was a time where I was trying to fight for my ego. Yeah, find the uh, crown of the moment, you know, uh, be the top uh, 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 dog of dog, uh, top, uh, yeah, top dog, you know, barking dogma, you know. But then, then I would realize that language is not the only thing that's here. So really, when your interest goes beyond language, your interest is going beyond uh, the tool that we have been using to define things, right? So then you go towards an experiential domain. And if you cultivate contentment with your direct experiential presence before your indirect ideology acts as you, you will actually have a very fast inner realms. So the, think of it this way. Uh, I trust the world in front of my eyes because what else can you do? <laughs> You know, and then uh, the world behind my eyes, I am that trust. Do you see? There is no me trusting anything anymore. Behind my eyes, I am the whole moment. In front of my eyes, I am a part of the moment. So, Dan, I hope that was, uh, that answer was helpful.
As the poet Rumi says, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place. I will meet you there. And when the soul sits on that grass, grassland, the world is too full to talk about. That means the evolution of the advanced communicator is being uh, simultaneous synonymous with the most advanced communication in the universal sector. Why do you guys think I'm talking about advanced communicators? You know, it's like we're the most intelligent thing on this planet and in the solar system. We haven't found other civilizations, you know. The only thing that comes to a comparison is kind of like how dolphins are using like more percentage of their brain than we are. Seldom is this said, but truth's door is already open. It is man who has not had the faith to turn the doorknob. And you know, I'll leave the listeners with this uh, quote. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time. <clears throat> and you know, the origin of it is unknown. But the quote is that when the child is born, <clears throat> the world, uh, uh, when the child is born, the world laughs and the child cries. Like the world is happy and new human consciousness has entered the system, you know? But, the second part of the quote says, but when the child uh, leaves this world, when the human being, uh, the old person, the ma man leaves this world, the world cries and the, the man laughs. Do you see the idea? That means the human being is born and the child cries. It doesn't know anything, but the world is watching us. That means if we forget the concept of God watching us, the newborn child is being watched by intelligence in the realm, by people. And if we build an advanced civilization, that will not just be a civilization that is smiling or uh, celebrating the human existence. It is honoring the human effort as if, you know, every DNA is kind of like, you know, uh, um, a servant of the realm. Because what else can you do? You serve yourself, you only advance. You serve the realm, everybody advances. If everybody advances, then you can relax, you know. To me, I'm actually, the concept of win-lose is done. I'm done with that. You know, it's too boring, you know. <clears throat> the idea should be win-win till the end of time. And when time ends, victory is one moment. We are free. Not because we can be, but because we are. Thank you for listening. I hope this episode uh, was helpful. Much blessings and namaste. Oh wait, there's questions in the chat section. <coughs> uh, Q sex, mash, mash self center of your own universe, not as humble as you would have us think. <coughs> well, well, guys, here's the thing. I mean, what else can I do? I, I have access to my own memories. All the things that I'm talking about is from like the archive of my own perception in this world. I haven't experienced what eight billion people have experienced at the same time. You know. <clears throat> so so in some sense we have no other choice I'm talking from my inner realms the whole point of this episode is that everybody has their own eyes but there are eyes are in the same room you know anyways guys thanks for listening blessings <clears throat>